Welcome. Uh, we have the great privilege and honor today to have with us uh, the Honorable Paul Hellyer, who uh, has been, among other things, uh, the former Minister of Defense and actually uh, also the Deputy Prime Minister of the nation that I call my own, Canada. Welcome, Paul. It's nice to be with you. You know, and uh, I've, I want to alert people that uh, uh, we have your, your new book, Light at the End of the Tunnel, A Survival Plan for the Human Species. And I think that that's what we'll be talking about today, and that's a very timely book. You write, and um, this is being recorded on July 13, 2011. You write that the next world war... And this is a speech that you delivered in, in, in Arizona at the beginning of 2011. The next world war is actually going to be the bankers against the people. I'm sort of par paraphrasing. It seems to me that that's very apt, given uh, the drama that's going on now with the threatened defaults uh, in Europe, North America. Could you give us uh, your thoughts of, of how how we got to this position and how this is going to play out. Well, it's a long story, but let me say you're absolutely right. It is a war between the bankers and the people. But so far, only the bankers are engaged. The people are not yet engaged. A few of us are trying to make a little noise and saying, hey, we have to do something or the future of the world is at stake. Certainly, the welfare of humanity is at stake. So we're going to have to turn the tables on the bankers and take back our democratic right to look after our own affairs. But people aren't doing that yet. And there are reasons for it, of course. One of them is that probably only about one person and maybe every hundred understand what money is and where it comes from. And they have this uh, peculiar notion that it's something sacrosanct and uh, oh money you know you have to treat it with the respect that you give to the gods and as a fact, matter of fact one of the chapters in my book if you will remember is that <clears throat> mammon rules the world well that is literally true mammon does ru rule the world gold rules the world money rules the world because the world is in the hands of an elite group of uh, professional bankers who over two and a half centuries have managed to set up what I call a, a Ponzi scheme, uh, which is really basically a, a fraud in order to create money out of nothing, lend it to people, including governments, especially governments, and then charge them interest on it. And this, this, is, this is wrong and it's got to be changed. Because unless it is, the most important problem facing the world today, which is really global warming, is, is over as far as success is concerned. Because countries like the United States and Britain and France and Germany and Spain and all the others don't have the money in order to make the changes from an oil economy to a clean energy economy that are absolutely essential to stop global warming and save the planet as a hospitable habitat for the human species. So we're in this situation where we either have to act and act quickly or the, the planet's in very, very serious trouble. So if you want me to uh, go back and, uh, and maybe take a few minutes to explain a little bit about money and what it is, basically. Yes, money, I think that that would be very helpful. Money is nothing more than the computer entry today. The first uh, governor and the brightest of our governors of the Bank of Canada, uh, Graham Towers, said that nothing was, the money was nothing but a, a book entry. But of course, he was talking in the day when they kept bank records and books, ledgers. If he were alive and talking about it today, he'd say all money is, is a computer entry. And uh, this is a little hard for some of my friends to understand how money is created. But let me take five or ten minutes to sort of go through the process step by step. 
Most people think that when they go to the bank to get a loan, that uh, what they're borrowing is the money that you or I may have deposited in the bank the day before or a week before. The chances of that being true are only about one in a million. Usually the banks are fully lent, and so if you go in for a loan, they have to create the money to lend to you. And the way the system works is this, that you go, let's say you want to buy a new car, um, it's going to cost you $35,000 that you need the cash for. So you go to your friendly banker and uh, say to him or her, I want to borrow $35,000 to buy a new car. They say, okay, uh, what collateral have you got? Say, do you have some stocks or bonds? And say, no. What about a second mortgage on your house or your cottage? Well, if they have that, that's fine. If not, they'll say, well, do you have a rich relative, a rich mother-in-law or someone who will co-sign for you? And when they're finally satisfied with the collateral that they need to guarantee the repayment of the loan, then they'll get you to sign a note. And you sign a note for $35,000, usually at prime plus a certain amount. And you sign that, and then they tap their computer, and a $35,000 entry appears in your bank account, a credit that you can go out and spend in order to buy your car. Now, seconds earlier, that money did not exist. It was created out of thin air, so to speak. And the way the system works is this, that they, they have a sort of double entry book, bookkeeping. And the note that you give them is put on one side of the ledger as a credit. And the money that they create to give you is put on the other side of the ledger as a liability. And this is the way they balance their books. And the way they make their money is really very simple. If you decided for example, to uh, not spend the 35000 right away. Let's say you saw something in the newspaper that the next year's models were coming out in two or three months and they were going to be better value and, uh, and have more uh, bells and whistles on them. And you decided you'd wait two or three months or four months before you buy your car. And you left the money in your account. They would probably pay you zero or, if anything, a quarter of 1% or some ridiculously low uh, interest rate for it while it's there. On the other side of the ledger, their side, they're going to charge you three or four or five or six or seven, you know, depending on the era, percent of annual interest on your note. So the difference, they, the money they make is in the difference between the quarter percent they pay you and the four or five or six or seven that they charge you. And that is called the spread. And that's how banks make their money. So basically, the more money they create, the more loans they make, the more money they make, because they have all of this increase in assets on the credit side of their ledger, and they're interest bearing. And so this is really, a, a, you know, it's a great, uh, a great system. Well, the next important uh, point, I guess, is how much of this can they do based on the reserves that they have. And uh, the reserves are what they have as capital or as cash in their vaults or whatever uh, in case uh, instead of spending the 35000 for a car, you'd walk in and say, well, I'd like my 35000 in cash. I'm uh, going to the races. You probably wouldn't say that, but that's probably what you might have that in mind. And, uh, and so, the, if only a few people go in and ask for their cash, the system works. It's a system based on faith. But if everybody goes in and asks for cash at the same time, it's not there. And that's when you have bank failures, because they only have a minimum amount of reserve in order to make good on the deposits that theoretically can be exchanged into money, into legal tender money. So th this, uh, this ratio, really, of how many times they can lend the same money 
is something that is worth taking a quick look at. Right, and, 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 and as you point out, this ratio started historically, say, in the 4 to 1, but now is up to the 20 to 1 or even more. No, actually, it started uh, at less than four to one. Um, I, I um, when I'm talking about this subject, usually just go back as far as the Bank of England being established. Okay. King William was fighting a war and he ran out of money, so somebody said, "Well, why don't you get a bank established? And they can lend you some." So he thought that was a good idea, and the rich people in London put in a uh, million two hundred thousand pounds of gold and silver, and lent it to the king at 8% interest, which is a pretty high interest rate for a government guaranteed loan. To show his appreciation, the king said, okay, now you can print, P-R-I-N-T, a million two hundred thousand pounds in banknotes and lend them to your rich friends at high interest rates. In other words, you can lend the same money twice, once to the king and once to your friends. Right. So they're lending the same money twice and collecting interest on it from both sources. Well then, as you suggest, over the years that ratio has become much more generous due to the combination of the larceny of the banks and the cooperation of politicians. In the early years of the 20th century in the United States, federally chartered banks had to have a gold reserve of 25 percent. and. Uh, that means they were allowed to lend the same money four times. In Canada, when I was young, uh, they had, the banks had to have a cash reserve of 8%, which means they could lend the same money 12 and a half times. Well, and over the years, um, that ratio got up to the point where some banks, Canadian banks, for example, were lending the same capital, because they changed the system from money reserve to a capital reserve, um, the same capital 20 times. And some of the New York banks were as high as 20, some 30. There was one bank, I can't remember the name of it, a few years ago that got up to 100 times. And of course it went broke because that's just a ridiculous ratio. And the reason that they're likely to go broke if they get the ratio too high is because of the value of their collateral, the value of their assets drops. Let's say that they have a ratio of 20 to 1. If the value of their assets drops by 5%, they're technically bankrupt. So that's all that has to happen for even the biggest of banks to be technically bankrupt is for the value of their assets to drop by 5%. Well then, as you know, during the meltdown 2007-2008, stocks, for example, went down 20-30%, real estate went down well, 20-30-40-50%, um, and so most of the big banks in the world were technically bankrupt and they were bailed out by the central banks including the Federal Reserve System uh, in the United States and it's interesting and this is a subject we can get into if you want to. Yes, yes, I, I, I'd like to get deeply into the Federal Reserve because I think that the history of that bank brings us up to the circumstances that we find ourselves into today. The Federal Reserve System uh, is deeply into it, was partly responsible for what happened, and uh, they bailed out the banks. They printed the money to bail out the banks, but they didn't do the same for the people. Right. So now the banks, in most cases, are doing all right. Not the little ones, but the big ones are doing all right. They're consolidating, they're making a lot of money, they're starting to pay these big bonuses again. Um, and they're buying a lot of government paper and making money on that because they can borrow from the Fed for a quarter of 1% and then buy government, government bonds and get 2 or 3 or 4%. And so the system is loaded in favor of the banks who are really the perpetrators of this Ponzi and loaded against the people who have to pay the taxes to pay the interest on the bonds that the banks buy from the government with money that was created out of thin air. Right. Now, you, you point out a, a history of 
the Federal Reserve Bank uh, going back to 1913, and there's some people who even say that the bank panic of 1907 was tr intentionally triggered by agents of the Rothschilds who were came over to the United States to trigger that bank panic in order to set up the need for a Federal Reserve, which then they they uh, brought about in 1913. Perhaps you could recapitulate some of that story. Well, this, is, this is the kind of thing that people should read for themselves. And I would suggest that some of them uh, get Ellen Hodgson Brown's book, Web of Debt, and just get the history of banking and what they have done and who was involved and the cooperation and collaboration that took place. And certainly the New York banks and the European banks were in collaboration with what happened in 1813, 18, rather, of, no, 1913, excuse me, getting yeah, my centuries yeah. wrong here. In 1913, they were in collusion to get the Federal Reserve Act put through Congress. And they, what really was at stake, they didn't like competition. So they decided that if they could get a monopoly, a cartel, in effect, worldwide, then they could sort of divide up the, the spoils. And so that's what the Federal Reserve System was all about. <clears throat> they had the secret uh, meeting in Jekyll Island, uh, and a uh, handful, five or six people, decided on what the uh, legislation should be. Um, first it failed because uh, it was too obvious, but then they sort of fixed it up a little bit and uh, got it through Congress. <clears throat> and it was probably the biggest heist in the history of the world. It's cost the American people trillions and trillions of dollars. Yes, yes. And, and um, the, I, I recall coming across a document uh, in a 1976 U.S. Senate subcommittee. Uh, and that subcommittee set out the beneficial ownership of all of the banks, private banks, commercial banks that own, and, and investment banks that own the Federal Reserve. Um, and the beneficial ownership seems to concentrate itself in just a few wealthy bloodline families so that we actually have this great concentration of the control of the world financial system in just a few families. Yes, yeah, so there are different figures, but uh, the one that's most commonly used is that about a hundred rich families control the system uh, for the world. and. Uh, that they exercise a, a power which is just absolutely uh, phenomenal. Now, the so that the Federal Reserve System is really a misnomer. It's it's a it's it's um, a it's a term that's intended to mislead because it's neither federal nor a reserve. It's not a true central bank. It's actually a private bank. Well, it's a, <laughs> it's, it's a, a, a private central. It's a private bank that has all of the advantages of a central bank and uh, probably none of the disadvantages. Right. It's and and so now, uh, Paul, of course, um, we're now uh, at a very interesting moment. And I, I want to reiterate that today is uh, July 13th, 2011. It's very hard to say what's going to happen. But here we have the United States with the U.S. dollar as still the world reserve currency. We have the President of the United States yesterday coming out with a statement that would seem like it would, I mean, it's earth shattering in terms of conventional politics. He said, well, I don't know if I can send out Social Security checks on August 3rd, which is the, at the beginning of the month. Those are 70 million checks. And uh, that's the traditional third rail of American politics. And uh, you have the Republicans and the Democrats have now broken off talks on the debt ceiling. Uh, and you have $10 trillion of public debt that has arisen since the administration of 
I mean, it has skyrocketed since the administration of George W. Bush in 2001 with wasteful foreign wars uh, on essentially sole source private contracts with uh, private companies that are owned by or operated by the vice president and other people. So there's this incredible self-dealing. And I'm, and I'm just wondering how, how you see this, this incredible situation playing out. It's, a, it's very difficult to say, but what you're bringing in now is sort of the industrial military complex that President Eisenhower warned us about. And there is a direct connection between the industrial military complex and the banking cartel that controls the world monetary system. A direct connection because the lines, as you suggest, run from the banking system through the corporation system. Uh, they have shares in the corporations and they have interlocking directorates where the directors, the, the senior officers of the big corporations uh, have uh, uh, directors' jobs in some of the banks, and they, they work together as a team to exploit the system, and our mutual friend uh, Carol Rosen right. um, has said that when she uh, was working with Dr. Werner von Braun, the famous rocket scientist who came to the United States uh, after World War II, that he had mellowed in his uh, senior years and had warned about the military-industrial complex always having to have an enemy. And he told her that first it would be the, uh, the communists, and then it would be the terrorists, and then it would be the extraterrestrials. Right. They have to have an enemy in order to justify these incredible expenditures for military operations. So as long as you've got an enemy, you can presumably go to Congress and say, oh, we have to spend hundreds of billions of dollars in order to prepare to fight the communists or the terrorists or the extraterrestrials or whatever it is. And therefore, we ask your cooperation and we're sorry that we can't tell you all of the secrets that you would like to know and that you should know under the Constitution, but we'd like you to trust us and to give us these hundreds of billions of dollars to spend, even though the federal debt is climbing out of control. And so this is all part of it. Who gains the most when countries like the United States go further and further in debt under the present system? Well, it's the bankers of the world because then they hold more U.S. paper money and they collect interest on it from the American people. And what happens to the poor American people? They lose their jobs and their benefits. And this is, the whole thing is just absolutely backwards to what it should be. And this is the reason I say that there's got to be a public uprising. There has to be a, an American spring or a global spring under which the people of the world say, enough is enough. We're tired of being slaves because, in fact, people are slaves to the monetary system. They spend most of their life paying taxes to pay the interest on bonds that their government has uh, taken out to finance uh, their governmental affairs and on their mortgages and on their credit cards. And there's just too much debt. Well. You say, why is there too much debt? Why is the United States so much in debt? Why is Canada, does it owe $600 billion in debt? Why is, is France so far in debt and Germany and, uh, and Greece, let alone Greece, I should say, and, and Spain and, uh, and Ireland? It is because all, practically all money is created as debt. There's no other, money, no other kind of money created. It's all created as debt, so if you want the economy to grow, somebody has got to borrow. And it either has to be individuals borrowing more through their credit cards or their mortgages on their houses, or it has to be governments. Somebody has got to borrow for the economy to grow. 
And right now you're seeing the reverse. You're seeing governments having to cut back because their lending, their borrowing power is running out on them. So, you know, in my speech in Arizona, one of the things I said was that any high school student should be able to see that if all money is created as debt, that the total debt in the world is tending toward infinity, which means that there's no way that it can be paid off. In other words, the system is absolutely yeah. berserk, and it has to be changed, and it has to be changed soon if we're going to have any hope for all the future of the people who are now uh, in such distress in the United States and in, in Greece and all over the world. Now, you call for the abolition of the Federal Reserve Bank. And uh, uh, as, as you do here in Canada, you've, you've called, I believe, uh, for the reinstitution and for the enhancement of the powers of the Bank of Canada as a proper public central bank. Getting over toward the uh, abolition of the Federal Reserve Bank, for which there is increasing popular support in the U.S., there are some Congress people who have proposed that, notably Ron Paul, although he says now he's going to leave, 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 leave Congress. Uh, do you think that that's a uh, an outcome that 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 can be reasonably uh, accomplished. Well, when you say reasonably accomplished, to, if you mean is it going to happen easily, the answer is no, because the bankers have the upper hand. Right. It should be accomplished, and I don't think there's a real future for the United States until they have abolished the Federal Reserve System and right. have either replaced it with a proper central bank or have nationalized the Federal Reserve and just taken it over and made it a government institution. Right. Most people think it's a government institution anyway. And they're just, they were deliberately lulled into believing this at the time the act was passed by calling it federal and calling it reserve. And as you pointed out, it's neither. It's just a bunch of private bankers who, in effect, have dictatorial power over the economy of the United States. And it, it, it's so bad, and I've seen it happen in Canada too, where they can decide who's going to get elected or get re-elected by manipulating the economy. And if they get a president in they don't like, well, all they have to do is make life miserable for the people and they'll vote against the president. Or they can do it the other way around. If they get somebody in that they really are happy with, who goes along with their industrial military complex or who is, is good for them, why well, they can encourage that person by, by playing the the strings properly in favor of their re-election. So it's, it's a diabolical system. I was uh, looking at something that somebody read me to me a couple of days ago, or sent me a couple of days ago, about a speech Ben Bernanke made uh, at the 80th uh, uh, birthday party for Milton Friedman. Right. Where he said to Milton Friedman and Anna Swartz that they were quite correct in saying that the Federal Reserve was responsible for the Great Depression, that the Federal Reserve had facilitated and then extenuated the Great Depression. You know, a terrible admission, really. But of course, what he said is, well, we're going to see that it never happens again. Well, I guess he had no idea when he said that how difficult it was going to be for the last three or four years. But he has gone part way towards preventing a depression, just far enough to save the big banks and keep the ship barely, barely afloat. But the people are still suffering. Exactly. And, and today, um, uh, July 13th, uh, 2011, uh, marks the, uh, the beginning of the secret meeting at Bohemian Grove, uh, at which the federal uh, uh, I believe that that Alan Greenspan was was actually brought there prior to his becoming Federal Reserve Chairman, and sort of uh, I guess there are secret initiation rites that go on there. I'm not quite sure, right? But 
there are just to give you uh, some 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 positive news. Uh, there is a demonstration planned today around the Bohemian Grove site by the people. Uh, people are just going to show up and uh, start bearing witness. So I think that uh, you know your words and those of others are starting to to take hold. Now let's get into what the good news will be uh, once we work and can can either secure nationalization or some sort of an abolition of the Federal Reserve. I was very struck by your words when you said, well, we could have, uh, say, 34%, if I recall, of the money would be government money that is created by the central bank. We would still have the commercial banks create 66% of the money. Why would we give commercial banks any role at all given all the trouble that they've caused humanity over the last number of centuries. I, I think um, and this is where uh, there's some difference uh, between monetary reformers. One of the problem with monetary reformers for the last 150 years is that everyone has their own solution. And each one thinks that their solution is better than the others. But in fact, quite a few of the solutions would work, but some of them would work better than others. And there are are many monetary reformers that would like the government to print all of the money. I have, uh, I have decided that that would not be the best solution um, because there are about three reasons. One, banking is a big industry and I don't want to eliminate it. I want to put a halter on it to bring it under control to take away its power to run the world and to take away its power to do evil because it has been responsible for both the Great Depression of the 1930s and the recent meltdown of 2007-2008. This, uh, this was established by the PCORA Commission that uh, a couple of New York banks had been responsible for the beginnings of the, uh, of the Great Depression and as uh, Bernanke indicated, the Fed uh, made it worse and collaborated with them rather than uh, saving the people. And then uh, Charles Ferguson in his excellent documentary, in, documentary Inside Job shows that a couple of major Wall Street banks were responsible for triggering the, uh, the meltdown of 2007-2008. So what I'm suggesting is to take away their power to do, be able to do things like that and to split the, the responsibility um, for money creation between the government and the private banks in a way that will still allow the private banks to extend credit to small business people and to for credit cards and uh, and this sort of thing, personal loans, and not have enough money to finance uh, levered uh, buyouts and to buy stocks on margin and to finance uh, uh, all of the crazy things that the banks have introduced in the last few years, the derivatives and the, uh, the gambling aspect of the banking industry, which has become, incidentally, the principal act aspect. There, there was a divorce between Main Street and, and Wall Street, and it was a, a complete divorce, and it's got to be ended. Now, if we were to go abruptly, well, if, if you go at all, from uh, a system where the banks have some power to create credit, to one where they have no power to create credit, then all of the little businesses would be have no access to credit. I see. And it would it would have an absolutely devastating effect on Main Street. People like me that had to borrow money to build houses and uh, and to develop land and to do things creatively that people like me and entrepreneurs do. They start with a little idea and then they. They persuade the bank to give them five or ten thousand dollars in those days, 
you know, twenty-five, fifty, a hundred thousand dollars today <clears throat> to expand and to <clears throat> develop their ideas. If you if you took away their right to create money totally, there would you would wipe out that facility unless you reestablished it as a government institution. Now, frankly, after spending most of my life in money, I think they would be just as crone to cronyism as the bankers are, and I think that they would use the money to perpetuate their own power rather than trying to do the best possible job for the people who elected them. So what I'm proposing is a system where they create, either through a central bank or like uh, Lincoln did when he created, when he printed the, the uh, greenbacks through the treasury, either one will work, will create enough money that they do not have to run deficits that they never have to borrow another penny from a bank anywhere, anytime, and that they can raise enough money in taxes and, uh, and so on from regaining full employment to start paying off some of the existing debt and reduce it. And of course, if you had to have a 34% cash reserve, as I'm proposing, then within a very short period of time, they would in effect be taking over 34% of the assets of the banks that would be reducing their their assets by 34 percent, and uh, and using a lot of it for uh, for paying off government debt. And so it's a, it's a system which will allow the world system to work for the people. It will restore democracy in the sense that with the establishment of reestablishment of a cash reserve system, governments, not bankers will be determining how fast the money supply should increase because at the moment it's the bankers who decide whether they're going to print X dollars or X plus Y and they've been very erratic about it so they print far too much money for a while and then they slow down and cause a recession or depression. That should never happen, they should never have been a recession or depression and there doesn't need to be one in future but they've got to change the system so that governments have the power that you expect them to have in a democracy of complete control of the most important economic tool in the whole arsenal, and that is the power to create money. So all they really need, in my opinion, is enough to, uh, to supplement their income from other sources to the point where they can balance budgets at all levels, federal, state, uh, municipal, and there's enough for all of the legitimate purposes of government at these various levels while still having a machine where, uh, where banks are forbidden, totally forbidden, to do most of the things that they're doing today, gambling and, uh, and uh, promoting and funding hedge funds and all this sort of stuff. But they and uh, leave them a very narrow, limited of thing, a margin of things that they can do, and that would be in effect the reason that they existed in the first place, at least theoretically, and that is to uh, to support the development of uh, of business enterprise and create jobs, and that's what they should be doing. Good, good. Now, just to shift, we're we're um, uh, just about uh, forty minutes in, and we're coming to the end of the segment, but I, I, I wanted to ask you, Paul, because you are probably uh, the leading uh, uh, world statesman who came forward uh, in this new century uh, to speak about the extraterrestrial presence, and that brought the world dialogue to a new level. And I wondered if, if you could share with us what you see the future of this engaged world dialogue about the extraterrestrial presence, where it's going, uh, where it relates to some of the subjects we've touched on 
all ready and what you see as the future for humanity as part of the larger intelligent civilization of species? Well, first of all, you give me too much credit, I think, um, but you're raising one of the most important issues facing mankind today. And um, again, one which is not widely understood. As I said earlier, probably only about one person in uh, 100 understands money, where it comes from. And uh, the majority, I would say, although an increasing minority, do not understand the extraterrestrial presence and technology and its potential because it has tremendous potential. But I, th I think the first thing, as you know, there's a push on now for disclosure. I think it's imperative that the United States government and other governments make public what they know about the subject because they know a lot about it even though they deny it. They deny having any interest in the subject. But they've been back engineering um, alien technology for 60 years and uh, what they've achieved in that length of time is, uh, is mind-boggling, as you know and as a lot of our colleagues know. But the public doesn't know and the, and the chance of them knowing is not great because there is a link between what I call in my book the Cabal. This light at the end of the tunnel is not a book about extraterrestrials, but it has a, a full chapter in it for primer or uh, beginners or skeptics who I think would find it of use and of, uh, of benefit to read. And um, the cabal, that is the controlling group of the extraterrestrial technology, has direct links to the banking cartel. And so if you're going to crack one egg, maybe it would be just as well to crack them both at the same time. Or maybe the second one would crack if the first one were cracked. And uh, the, the reason I'm primarily, well, there, there are various reasons, as you know. I would like to know um, how we treat the visitors. Do we still treat them as enemy alien? Because, as you know, they were designated... Uh, enemy aliens by General Twining uh, more than half a century ago. Does that des designation still stand? And if so, why? And uh, what proof do we have that they are not benevolent? Because most of the evidence that I see indicates that, uh, that in fact they are benevolent. And I know that there's, there's always a rumor that there's one species that isn't, but uh, no one has ever been brave enough to uh, name it and say which uh, one it is. <laughs> so uh, and I'm on disclosure, so that, you know we can talk about these things and say, right. "Well, where's the proof? Let's have an let's have an inquiry and and have you come up with uh, with some proof and not just uh, some some uh, misinformation or disinformation that you may be spreading around the cosmos." And to go back to my principal reason, I guess for interest is I think that in cooperation with the extraterrestrials that the cabal has produced exotic energy sources and that they are essential to the switchover, the fast switchover from the oil economy to a ex clean energy economy to use that phrase in the ten years that I think is the absolute maximum that we have. And it just it upsets me more than I can express in words to hear our leaders talk about drilling more wells in the uh, in the Gulf of Mexico or allowing more oil sands projects in the uh, in the Alberta tar sands or or drilling for oil in the Beaufort Sea and uh, all of this sort of thing. It's too late for that. It's too late for more oil drilling. It's too late for wind farms. We haven't got time for all of that stuff. And we've got to do something, and we've got to do it now. And, you know, whether 10 years is fast enough or not, I don't know. But I took 10 years from my book because I don't think, knowing human nature and government in particular, that we can do it much faster than that. Because even to do it in 10 years, 
would require the same kind of mobilization that we had to win World War II, where we just put all of our energy into it and we changed the industrial system around and really directed it towards a wartime, uh, a wartime industry, a wartime industrial system. And we have to do exactly that with directing the whole apparatus to creating new, to using these new forms of energy which we think exist and using them to replace uh, carbon uh, wherever it's being used, whether it's automobiles or airplanes or, or ge electrical generating plants, whatever. Just to replace one with the other and to do it during this 10 year time frame and make sure that it's done. Now, it's, I think, I'm, I'm convinced if I was given the power to do it, I'm convinced that it could be done in 10 years if there was a worldwide determination that that be the priority project, that it is so important to our grandchildren and great-grandchildren that we just have to do it and if we don't, we're absolutely totally derelict. So that is what I believe. Well then, of course, that brings us back right back to the other half of, this, of the problem, which is the uh, monetary complex, the banking cartel, because until we give sovereign countries back their right, until they take back, more precisely, that, let's make that clear, they don't have to be given back anything. The countries own the right to print money. It's the people's right. The pre people own it. It's, it comes down from the sovereign. The sovereign used to create all the money. So that in the United States, it's the Congress and the government that have the right to print money, not the Federal Reserve System. It was the Congress that gave the Fed the responsibility. Terrible mistake, because what they did in effect was say, here's the whole thing, you do it, and, and you benefit from it, instead of the people benefiting. So how can you call it a democracy when the most important tool in the economic arsenal is outside the control of government when it's in the hands of a few private individuals who benefit from not solving the problems, who benefit for, from continuing the old system and continuing with the old problems. So there's a tie-up between what we have to learn on the monetary side and what we have to learn from the extraterrestrial side and how much has been accomplished. And we really have to try and find out what is in the minds of the people who have been developing, uh, presumably uh, trying to replicate uh, space travel with, uh, with American versions of, uh, of flying saucers, and, uh, and whether their intentions are friendly or, or whether they're not. And they've also been developing weapons, as you know, uh, for the that are diabolical and can be used against people on Earth as well as uh, visitors from outer space. And these are things that should be in the open and the Congress should be debating them. Congress should be asking the questions of all of the people who have worked in what they call the black operations for the last few decades and uh, as well as the ones that are working in them now. And I guess uh, about the only way that this is going to happen is if the Congress ever says, well, we're going to cut off your money until you come clean and talk. But then to a quote from, uh, from Light at the End of the Tunnel, again, uh, I have a, in the, uh, the chapter called We're Not Alone in the, Co in the uh, Cosmos, I quote from Jim Sparks, who was an abductee. Right. Who, and he, he allowed me to put in a fairly lengthy quote Okay. from his book, in which he talks about amnesty. And he got this from the extraterrestrials themselves, because they're smart cookies, and they said, you're going to have to grant amnesty right. to these people to talk, because they have broken just about every law in the book. And you wouldn't expect people to go before a committee and tell the truth if they're going to wind up uh, spending the rest of their lives in jail. So the Congress would have to repeal the... Uh, the Security Act or whatever it is and and or grant a special amnesty 
to anybody who has work, been working in this field and who is willing to tell the truth because the truth must come out and it must come out soon because it too has been one of the one of the major drains on US financial resources nobody knows how much money has been spent on the black ops and some of the estimates as you know run up into the trillions exactly and uh, and does Congress admit this and where what were they doing and when they were supposed to be exercising their constitutional right to know what they were voting money for because they voted a lot of money for projects that they didn't understand and that they couldn't really go out and say that were essential because they didn't know what they were. So we've got a lot of tying up uh, some special knots here and uh, or connecting the dots as Paul Harris would call it and changing the system right across the board uh, starting with the with the banking cartel and uh, then getting uh, full disclosure from the people who uh, really know what mind-boggling developments have, uh, have taken place in the last 60 years. But I think, you know, at, as you point out, those, those two areas, number one, re 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 returning the people's sovereignty to the creation of money and to the creation of proper of, of proper central banks, and number two, uh, making the technologies that we know through whistleblowers and other sources now exist, now do exist in the national security state, and could, uh, with a reasonable transition, make this planet a paradise planet. Quote, Absolutely. Quote. Absolutely. Yeah, that, those are two key issues. I we we've sort of reached the the end of this uh, segment, but I wondered, Paul, if if there are any final thoughts. Uh, you you have focused now on a survival plan for the human race, and I wondered if there are any final thoughts that you'd like to share with us about our survival as a species. Well, I th I think frankly it is at stake. I know that the extraterrestrials are concerned about what we're doing with our planet and that they think we're headed for disaster um, and that's what basically what my book is about. I say the world is going to hell in the handbasket unless we the people do something about it. We have the power to do something about it, theoretically. We have the power, but we don't exercise it and we're going to have to show the people who have been conniving and uh, and conspiring, if you want to use the word, actually it's not a word I like, but who have been manipulating our future for so long, we're going to have to take that power away from them, restore it to elected officials, and then say, these are the things that we want. And one of them is we want you to start printing, if you want to call it that, or manufacturing money enough to end the recession, to end this massive unemployment all over the world, not just in the United States and Canada, but to get people back to work so that they're paying taxes and those taxes then will balance the budgets, you know, help balance the budgets in future. And we want it to be done now and then we want you to take the surplus money and start spending it to, uh, to save the planet before it's too late. And, and to, as you suggested, get the uh, extraterrestrials uh, uh, to help and provide us with some of their medical knowledge and to create the sort of paradise on earth that uh, our Canadian uh, person, Wilbert Smith, talked about uh, 60 years ago uh, after he had some direct information from the terrestrials who gave the impression that they were there to help us but we have to ask for the help. We have to to cooperate and not to continue to shoot at them and try and uh, and treat them as enemy uh, persons. So there there are some huge issues, and I just hope that <clears throat> people will uh, will say, okay, enough's enough, and we're going to do something. And incidentally, there's a website that I would recommend is uh, www.victoryfortheworld.net. Okay. And the www.victoryfortheworld.net not only has my speech on that people could download, okay, 
It has some recommended books, but it also has some action plans. Oh, good. And uh, for one for Canada, one for the United States, and one for the world. And this would be somewhere for people to go if they want to uh, start uh, getting together and uh, preparing to uh, somehow exert their authority and, uh, and stop the uh, rotten apples from uh, spreading any further. Excellent. Excellent. www.victoryfortheworld.net and it's and it's about time that we had a victory for the world. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. Well, Paul, thank you so much for joining us. We're we're certainly happy uh, that that you are here, fighting the good fight, uh, that you're sharing your knowledge and your wisdom with us, and um, uh, we we wish you and uh, all of us future a future victory for the world. Absolutely, and it can be done. Let's make sure that it is done. And that would be our legacy to our future generations. Excellent. Thank you.